for inviting me to my well, first city really, my first town, Bucharest, which I still very much love, although I'm not very often here. Um, so my talk will be about Kant. Um, I hope, in fact, it will help our discussion so far. I'm making some very uh, relevant uh, points, I hope, to the discussion. So, I come originally from philosophy of language. Uh, in fact, first I wanted to write a PhD on Gareth Evans and on conceptual content. But then I changed my mind. Um, right now I'm working on Kant, uh, partly because a few years ago our common friend, Michael Inwood, uh, from Trinity College Oxford, very gently pushed me towards looking in more depth at the classics of philosophy instead of just spending time on the last three or four issues of mind and philosophical quarterly. So that's what I'm doing right now, hopefully successfully or fruitfully. Now I'll give you first a very brief crash course on the first critique, the critique of pure reason in Kant. Then I'll discuss a little bit uh, his theory of ideas, Kantian ideas, not to be confused with ideas as representations, Vorstellungen, uh, in uh, English translation of Vorstellungen. Then uh, say a few, more, uh, a few more things about the features of Kantian ideas, their transcendence, their platonic character, good and bad uses of ideas, and finally, my one original point in this talk, the strangeness or twistedness of the ideas of reason, which relate directly to what we just discussed. And if there is time, hopefully as a bonus, uh, three slides on Hans Weichinger, Philosophy, the philosophy of as if, if there is uh, time. This is what uh, Katerin asked me to do. Okay, good. So, the first critique. First, it's questions. What, what does the critique of pure reason, Kant's critique of pure reason, deal with? What questions is it asking? First of all, Kant was an architectonic philosopher. He was not wasting his time just on, on mundane, trivial topics. He really wanted to know all. He was interested in the greatest. Uh, problems and topics of mankind, and that involved freedom of the will, immortality of the soul, and the existence of God. Can we have knowledge about these super things? That's the first question. The second one is, can we have a priori knowledge of the external world, of the most general features of the universe? Is metaphysics possible as a consequence? That would be the discipline answering the first two questions. Can we resolve the so-called antinomies, which for Kant were extremely important? Antinomies are, for instance, two propositions for each of which we have equally good grounds for, uh, for uh, asserting them, for affirming them. And there seems to be, therefore, an, an, an antinomy attention between the two of them. He was much concerned with uh, that in 1798 to a former uh, opponent of his, Christian Garve, who, who massively criticized the prolegomena, but he, they then became very good friends. In 1798, just before Garve were, was to die and Kant himself a few, days, a few years later, he wrote to Garve saying, in fact, what drove my whole philosophy was the hope to be able to solve the so-called scandal of an apparent contradiction of reason with itself. So um, the solution of antinomies is driving the whole critical philosophy. And finally, a positive question he's trying to address in the critical pure reason is, what are actually the elements of human reason as such? What are its building blocks? And the answers to these questions are, no, we can't have theoretical knowledge about these super things, uh, soul, immortality, soul, uh, immortality of soul, uh, existence of God and freedom of the will. We can only have rational faith in them that belongs to his moral philosophy. Yes, we can have synthetic a priori knowledge uh, of the external world, of the universe. However, this is only phenomenal knowledge, meaning only knowledge of objects as they appear to us, to our senses, not as they are in themselves. And therefore, is metaphysics possible? Yes and no, depending on how uh, you, you twist it, yes, as a knowledge of the a priori conditions of the experience of the external world, no, as numenal knowledge, you can't have numenal knowledge of God, etc. Uh, and then, of course, yes, we can solve the antinomies if we simply realize that uh, um, 
we can't have numenal knowledge, then the antinomies uh, turn out to be mere illusions. They are not genuine paradoxes of human reason. And finally, the elements of human reason are, of course, inferences, uh, judgments, concepts, intuitions, and schemas. Uh, very briefly, why these five types of elements, really, I, I should say, inferences, because in science we need inferences all the time, trivially speaking, the transition from one set of secured uh, truths or, or propositions to another one less secured, so this gives us inferences. Inferences are con built out of or composed out of judgments, also be all men are model, etc. Uh, sorry, judgments are composed out of concepts, subject, uh, subject term and predicate term are in Kant's theory of judgment concepts. However, we need also intuitions to mediate between subject and predicate because in science we are interested in informative judgments, not in analytical or tautological uh, judgments. Hence, we need information, we need a mediation between subject and predicate in a judgment, we need what he calls intuitions, which are either perceptual, external, or internal, a priori, space and time. And finally, we, get, we need also schemas to mediate between concepts and intuitions. In fact, it's ending in an infinite regress, unfortunately, in this theory. But okay, good. So, so far, so good. So, concepts are one element of human reason. They subdivide. This is from a, a, a later passage in the Transcendental Dialectic, UCB 595. He subdivides a priori concepts, so not con empirical concepts like pizza or, or glass or something, but a priori concepts like uh, uh, unity, etc. He subdivides them into categories, ideas and ideal. I will be mostly talking about ideas. I will just give you a quick characterization of these three types of a priori concepts. Categories he characterizes as mere forms of thinking. They are intellectual forms which are required, uh, to, are required for us to be able to entertain any kind of judgment about the external world. For instance, substance would be one such category. In order to be able to say the cup is on the table, I need to be able to conceptualize the cup as a substance, but I also need to be able to sub, uh, conceptualize it as a unity, um, as something that has causal powers, uh, causation, etc., uh, modality, possibility, actuality. All these are categories. They are all implicit in any uh, intelligible judgment about the external world. By themselves, Kant tells us, categories have no objective reality. By that he simply means if you were to play around just with categories without having perceptions and intuitions, you wouldn't get knowledge. That's, this is what traditional, uh, traditional metaphysicians like Leibniz and Thought and Spinoza, of course, were trying uh, to do just to play around with concepts. That's not good enough for Kant. That's his major, uh, he thinks that's his, much, his major uh, innovation that we need in addition to concepts also, uh, sorry, in addition to categories also intuitions. Okay? Then ideas as a second uh, possible type of uh, a priori concept. He says of them that they are further removed from objective reality. Examples for ideas are the world, freedom, virtue. These are super concepts, if you want. Um, what, why are they super concepts? Because there is no appearance, no external object of my senses which can represent them in concreto. In theoretical reason, categories stand for, com for completeness, which experience can only approximate. That's, what, that's how he understands ideas. And finally, the ideal that goes even further, he thinks that's even more removed from objective reality than ideas. What are Ideals, uh, examples would be the stoic wise man, or maybe Jesus, and of course God. This would be just a few examples. He says of them in the critique of judgment, not critique of purism, critique of judgment, an ideal is the representation of an individual entity as adequate to an idea, something that refers to or is, corresponds to 100% to an idea. Say, the idea of virtue, an object which would correspond to it 100% would be Jesus or the, the stoic wise man. 
But that's not possible. There is no such thing. Of course, Jesus existed. That's not the point. But he seems to be implying that Jesus was not 100% uh, corresponding to the idea of the virtue. I don't know what he had in mind there. Okay, he also says, uh, then again, back to the critique of the reason, an ideal is an individual thing determinable or even determined by the idea alone. Good. So, categories, ideas, and ideal, or ideals. Now, going slightly back to Plato, um, Kant has some very beautiful passages in the, in the critique of few reasons. He's telling us why he's employing this term idea or idea. He says it's coming from, uh, from Plato. Aristotle's categories are not good enough. We need them, as already uh, explained. But beyond Aristotle's categories, we need some other type of a priori concepts, which are ideas. They originate in Plato. He describes him as the noble philosopher for whom ideas are archetypes of things themselves. And, and Kant continues, Plato realized that our mind feels a much higher need than just to merely obtain experience about the external world, just to play around with categories and intuitions. We aim for cognition which, is far, which far transcends the bounds of experience. Yeah, that's, that's Kant, yeah? that's not uh, Plato. No empirical object can ever coincide with ideas, as said. Ideas are totalities, which, he says, are necessary concepts whose object cannot be given in any experience. That's taken from the prolegomena. Still, uh, Kant says, they have their own reality, ideas have their own reality, and are by no means mere fictions. In English, we say. It's the German word, which just means unfounded, inane, or even maybe uh, insane inventions, figments of, of the mind. He doesn't think that, he thinks they actually have their own reality, in fact they are necessary. Now, a very important feature then of ideas is that they are transcendent, he calls them so, not me. Uh, here's a quote, every single experience is only a part of the whole sphere of its domain. But the absolute totality of all possible experience is itself not experience, is itself not an experience. And this absolute totality he wants to call an idea. Now, it's a bit hard stuff, um, uh, hard to accept and swallow. I'll try to make very briefly sense of this by making a distinction between two types of transcendence. One is what I would like to call global transcendence and the other one is local transcendence. That's not a distinction Kant makes, but I'm just trying to make sense of his um, conception of ideas. Global transcendence is simply a transcendence which is about an absolute totality. For instance, the world as a whole. Yeah? If you think about the world as a whole, then we would, we would be counting individual experiences about the world across all sciences, or natural sciences, as cognitions of the world. Is it not funny that we are capable to do that? Even so, there is not one single experience of the world as such. Nevertheless, we make sense of empirical science as being a science, as, uh, we make sense of any empirical science as being a science of the world, and we make sense of all empirical sciences as being sciences of the world. How is, that, how is that possible? So that's global transcendence and then local transcendence would be a transcendence of some super concept with respect to a particular domain, scientific domain. Here is my example in astronomy. Think of some astronomer who is interpreting the uh, radio, the data coming from some radio telescope here in this case, an image taken from a supernova uh, remnant, the remains of some supernova remnant here from 1181 uh, AD, the astronomer looking at his image, which is a composed, constructive representation, it's not direct representation, it's not direct given empirical content, that's a myth, by the way, okay? Uh, the astronomer knows, right, how to place this particular image within the whole scope of his science. And he also knows that he won't confuse, how not to confuse this with other sciences, such as chemistry or 
dentistry or cooking, maybe. cooking is a science. Here is an example for that, if you don't believe me. Take these two, uh, two pictures, these are simply just pictures of the same supernova remnant, but um, of different resolutions. If you look at this, this is not an example for direct observation. There is no such thing in sophisticated science. It doesn't mean we are not observing reality. It's just that our access to reality, our scientific access to reality, is very sophisticated. So, in order to be able to read this images here, you would have to have a lot of knowledge. And in particular, you would have to be able to locate this particular image in the whole scope of your discipline in astronomy. So, if Kant is right about what he means by these strange things which he calls ideas, then something like ideas might be in fact uh, involved on a local level already in every empirical science, especially every mathematical empirical science, whether also beyond in the transcendent sense of ideas, uh, we shall see. Okay, good. So, so far so good. Um, now, let, let's look at the, the, the uses of ideas. Uh, Kant distinguishes between good uses and bad uses of ideas. There seems to be something fictional about uh, the ideas of reason, simply because, as I said, no objects of knowledge can ever correspond to them entirely. In other words, ideas are not constitutive of empirical knowledge. Nevertheless, on the other hand, they are not mere English things, but they are not crazy inventions. In fact, Kant claims they give us orientation or guidance in our, uh, in our sciences, and therefore they are, he calls them, regulative. So they are not constitutive, they are regulative, whereas categories, of course, are constitutive as are intuitions. Okay, ideas give us closure, completion, completion, satisfaction for totality, because human reason does look for that. For example, for the totality of all causal conditions, in other words, for the ultimate explanation of everything. The ultimate explanation for everything is nothing that we can ever achieve, but it is still an ingredient of scientific enterprise. It's as it were the ideal that we always like to play to play with in the background. We just don't want just to know how this table is built and that microphone. We want to be able to be the grand scheme of things eventually in Plato's case, I suppose, no, not anyone else. Okay, indeed, ideas express our craving for absolute reality, for what Kant calls the totality of all possibility, the totality of all possible predicates. That's a very tricky passage uh, in the Critique of Pure Reason, in, in the chapter on the idea of reason, God, really. Uh, he says that ideas give us the principle of what he calls complete determination. I've tried to formalize it here, so for all predicates P, for all objects X, um, X is P or X is not P, so that's just the principle of, uh, of excluded uh, middle. You think, if you look at the formula, in fact Kant doesn't think that's, that's the law of excluded middle at all. The law of excluded middle, according to Kant, is just a schematic principle. It doesn't tell, it doesn't quantify over all possible predicates and over all possible objects. The principle of complete determination, by contrast, does. But in order to be able to do that, you have to have some conception of all possible predicates and of all things. Okay? That's not something that any science can tell you. It goes beyond it. In fact, science presupposes that. That's, that's his idea. And of course, given that he lived in the 18th century, which was much more theological uh, and religious and much less secular than our own times, whether that's good or bad, that's a different issue, he calls this totality, um, uh, this, this totality of possibility God, the ens realism, the, uh, the most real thing. Okay, this was the good use of ideas. Now to the bad use. As I said, ideas are not Hirngespinste, however they can lead to Hirngespinste, they can lead to crazy conceptions, 
When can they lead to crazy conceptions? When we misunderstand their regulative nature as being constitutive. Okay? That's when we apparently go astray according to Kant. When we realize that ideas are, have a merely regulative nature, then there is no problem, otherwise there is a problem. In other words, when we believe that God, soul, world, freedom stand for things about which we can have genuine knowledge, and genuine knowledge is always for Kant, either empirical or synthetic, uh, a priori. When we fall prey to this belief, our reason mistakes its own constructions for something real. And so it entangles itself, that's the drama of human reason, in natural illusions and contradictions, such as the antinomies. I've mentioned the antinomies, it is just one pair of the antinomies, there are four of them. The world has a beginning in time, as opposed to, as opposed to the proposition, the world has no beginning in time. For both of these propositions, we can give equally good justifications. I will skip that all because I suppose I'm running out of time. Do I have a bit more time? Yeah, a bit, yeah. Uh, well, then I should maybe explain this briefly. So, why is the first proposition quite justifiable? Well, assume so the world has a beginning in time. Now, assume that, uh, no, the world doesn't, ha doesn't have a beginning in time. It has existed forever. Well, if it, had, if it has existed forever, how much time must have passed for the present moment to arrive? How much time? Infinite, infinitely, right? infinitely much time. An infinite amount of time must have passed for the present to arrive. How is that possible? It's not possible, right? Okay, so that's, that's one problem. Let's take now the negation of this proposition. The world has no beginning in time. Okay? Well, if the world has no beginning in time, then it must have started at some point. Say, a thousand years ago, I am a very biblical inspired philosopher, so I believe it was created a thousand years ago. Uh, well, a thousand years, but what about the one year prior to it, or the one second prior to it? We seem to be able to make sense of that. And on Kant's conception, especially, we can make sense of uh, a period of time prior to creation, prior to objects existing, because he's like Nietzsche about space. Space is just a set of relations between physical entities, right? Hence, if there was a first moment in time, given that we can still make sense of something prior happening to it, that must have involved the existence of other material objects and that we need to the contradiction uh, by the assumption. Okay, good. So this was about the good, good and the bad uses of ideas. Finally, the methodological importance of ideas. If we realize that ideas are not categories, we realize that all those who pretend to give us an ontology, the most general theoretical cognitive account of uh, uh, the universe, but also who tell us that they know God, the existence of God, the soul, etc., are deceiving themselves. It follows from that the traditional metaphysicians were the victims of deep confusion and were wasting their time. People like Aquinas, Suarez, Descartes, Malbranche, you name it. And it follows from that, for Kant, that without a distinction between categories and ideas, metaphysics is absolutely impossible or is at best a random, bungling attempt to build a castle in the air without a knowledge of the materials uh, or of their fitness for any purpose. So the distinction between categories and ideas are of dramatic importance for the construction of metaphysics according to Kant and for the rejection of nonsense in philosophy. Okay, good. So, so far so good. I tried to explain some of the features of Kantian ideas. Now, a slightly more twisted, darker, obscure issue in his theory. So, I have explained that in their regulative use, ideas are good, and in their constitutive use, they are bad. However, I think the story doesn't end here, for you could say that even the constitutive use in Kant's theory has its own good use. Okay? Why is that so? 
Well, simply because Kant eventually claims that the regulative use of ideas is a use of ideas as if they were constituted. That's how he describes it. So uh, I will show this to you in a second uh, by means of some quotations from the critique. So in other words, ideas are very, very strange animals, right? And human reason is schizophrenic because he's telling us on the one hand regulative use of ideas is bad, constitutive is good, but it turns out upon analysis that the regulative use of ideas involves reference to a fictional, yeah? As if use of constitutive, uh, of, uh, as if constitutive use of, of ideas. Okay, so I should give you some quotations if you don't believe me. Here is one from the Critique of Pure Reason. We must view everything that can belong to experience as if it formed an absolute by completely dependent, uh, but completely independent unity, and yet also at the same time as if the sum of all appearances, the sensible world, had a single highest and all sufficient ground beyond itself, a self subsistent original creative reason. For it is in the light of this idea of a creative reason that we so guide the empirical, so scientific units here, the empirical employment of our reason as to secure its greatest possible extension by viewing all objects as if they drew their origin from such an archetype. I think it's very evident here that he does believe that the good regulative use of ideas involves a twisted use of them. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, another quote. May we not at least think this being, we've got here, which is distinct from the world in analogy with the objects of experience? The answer is certainly, but only as an object in idea and not in reality. Namely, only as a being. Oh, sorry, only as being a substratum to us unknown of the systematic unity, order and purposiveness of the arrangement of the world. An idea which reason is constrained to form as the regulative principle of its investigation of nature. So be very careful here. You might be really put off here by his reference to God, uh, uh, I think. But forget about God. Think of the totality of all possibilities. I replace that with that, um, at least for uh, pedagogical reasons and for analytical reasons. And finally, the last one, which I think is the most interesting passage and does point to a schizophrenic uh, understanding of human uh, reason, according to Kant. Can we assume a wise and omnipotent author of the world? Undoubtedly, we may. And we not only may, but must do so. We must believe in God, right? Or the totality of all possibilities, if you want. On the other hand, do we then extend our knowledge beyond the field of all possible experience? By no means. We have merely presupposed a something, he says, transcendental object, as a mere something, of which, as it is in itself, we have no concept whatsoever. It is only in relation to the study of nature, to the systematic and purposive ordering of the world, which, if we are to study nature, we are constrained to presuppose that we have thought this unknown being by analogy with an intelligent agent. Intelligent agent in itself, an empirical concept. So everything points in Kant here towards the empirical study of nature, but it involves or implies these super concepts, um, ideas and ideals. Okay, there are also, this was all Kant's theoretical philosophy, there are also moral and aesthetic uses of ideas in Kant. I will not discuss this here. What I will just very briefly now um, still suggest is, you might say, well, I don't know, this sounds all really very fishy to me, these ideas, do they really exist? Oh, okay. My trial has expired, it's finished. So, um, can we make sense of this today with respect to contemporary philosophy? I would suggest yes. Here are... Uh, sorry, this one, make this big again? Ah, okay. 
I will give you some possible examples of investigation of the application of Kantian ideas in contemporary core areas of philosophy. Yeah? In moral philosophy, that's probably trivial, the concept of virtue and happiness, there is no virtuous man, fully virtuous man, there is no fully, fully happy uh, man. By happy he means, I mean he is happy and moral at the same time, so what he means by Zeligkeit. In political philosophy, justice is another one of these super concepts. There is no 100% just state. Sovereignty might be one such. Freedom. Weichinger explores some of these. These are relatively trivial examples. But now I move on to theoretical philosophy. So I would suggest that even in theoretical disciplines, we have maybe a use a secret or implicit use of Kantian ideas without realizing it. So, the concept of propositions, for instance, in philosophy of language, in semantics, could be seen in this way. For instance, if you follow the so-called Californian conception of propositions, such as David Kaplan's, according to which a proposition is a set of possible worlds, or on another related model, uh, a set of Possible of all the circumstances in which a sentence is true. Well, just think as an analytic philosopher about the words coming out of your mouth. A set of possible worlds or, or circumstances in which your sentence is true. We never have a grasp of that because that's a totality. We have a, a grasp of individual circumstances in which a proposition is true. But of course, we want to say and uh, semanticists would like to say understanding a sentence is the grasp of the proposition and that is the grasp of this bloody totality yeah, of sets of, of, possi uh, of possible words or circumstances so that would be one possible example to, to look into another one would be in epistemology yeah, the study of vagueness very much brought to prominence by Timothy uh, uh, Williamson with his famous book on, on vagueness uh, he claims that vagueness is an all-pervasive feature of human reasoning and human cognition. If that is so, we can't get rid of it, and that means that our concept of precision, by contrast, could be something like a Kantian ideal. In logic, we might have Kantian ideas implicit in model logic, and also maybe in the logic of demonstrative. Why in model logic? Because in model logic, we talk about quantification over all possible worlds. That's one way to define logical necessity. Well, according to Kant, can we have experience of even this concrete world, this actual world? No. Can we have then experience about all possible worlds? Well, even less so. So on Kant's conception of, of uh, totality of, of ideas, um, in model logic we already have such a very very strong, uh, uh, sorry, very abstract uh, super concept. Logic of demonstratives might be another interesting example. Uh, Kaplan's theory of uh, demonstratives, he introduces there in his uh, actual formal semantics the so called completely alien entity for which he coins this sign. I don't know how to express this sign. Does anybody know how to express that sign? Verbally? Well, Dagger, you said dagger. Okay, thank you. Dagger, dagger, yes. So that would be another example. He thinks of this, comp he needs that completely alien uh, entity because he wants to be able to stipulate truth conditions for any proposition whatsoever, including propositions which uh, contain vacuous terms, empty terms. And in order to still get a semantic value out for the whole proposition, he needs them to assign. Uh, some very weird entity even for vacuous or empty terms. And this supposed completely alien entity, he tells us, is neither in the set of all objects, of all entities, that's you, nor in the set of all positions, of all spatial locations, which is P, the set P. Again, that points very strongly to something like a Kantian idea, because the set of all possible locations, you might want to say, is empirical space. If this completely alien entity is not part of that set, it is not part of space, then it is not a possible object of experience. What is it then? Okay, 
Good. And then finally, in metaphysics, uh, again, Timothy Williamson, his, uh, his discussion of the concept of everything, he thinks that we have in formal languages, but even in natural languages, an implicit reference to a quantification over everything there is. Everything whatsoever there is. He gives, there a, he gives a very sophisticated account of that. That's, that's a discussion that happened uh, in the last 10 years. That would be another maybe possible example uh, for an application of Kantian ideas. So, so far so good, this was Kant, yes? And now, is there time for the bonus episode on Viking? Well, I would suggest no. that we stop here and okay. we go with the questions. Okay. <clears throat> so, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so contradictions very important there is showing uh, why they don't have this uh, transcendental use. Uh, and the argument for the categories is that uh, in, the, in the analytic and the aesthetic, um, categories cannot have this uh, transcendental use because the object uh, has to be given to them. Is that, is that the argument? Not in the aesthetic, in the analytic. In the analytic. Only the analytic yes. Okay. Aesthetic is just about intuition. Right. But in the phenomena and noumena, uh, I can acknowledge the logical possibility of using the categories uh, in order to acquire knowledge of uh, transcendent objects, as you say, objects that are not given through the senses. And he also acknowledges the, the, the uh, necessity of giving arguments for uh, that claim. Uh, in your presentation, you haven't given any arguments for that. So, would you, do you? You think yes, there is a very strong argument for that claim that the category can help can, uh, generate knowledge of objects or of things or of structures only if they are given objects? Yes, so thank you very much, very, very interesting question. So in this uh, section in, on phenomena and noumena, it distinguishes between the positive and the negative use of the noumena, right? And um, so Kant's idea is here obscure, I think, maybe contradictory, I'm not sure, I haven't made up my mind on this one. Um, the genuine use of categories uh, has to involve intuitions, but that's of twofold, because as I said, intuitions can be empirical or pure. And so the genuine use of categories will be a use of them either in combination with empirical intuitions or in combination with pure intuitions. Why? Because, um, because their genuine use would be either a use for everyday judgments, right, or scientific uh, empirical judgments, or for synthetic a priori judgments. This, these are the, the two options we have. He says essentially that's what he tries in the transcendental deduction. He tries to show that that's the only genuine use of, of categories. Uh, I don't know whether we can go into the transcendental deduction. I don't fully understand it, but that is, that, that's why he's doing the work for this. But now what you can say is, yeah, but wait a second. I mean, in pure, in pure reasoning about categories, right? Why can't I just think about them, right? Uh, what sort of intuition is given to me when I think about the category of substance as such, right? Well, no empirical intuition, Kant would, uh, would say, and I think we agree with him that. But when I think about the category of substance otherwise, meaning purely, is necessarily space on t or time purely given to me, pure space and time, it's unclear. Well, he says the following. I mean, it seems to be, so to be very precise of Lee, it seems to be that there are three types of assertions or discourse about categories in the critique of pure reason. One is discourse about categories 
as employed in empirical judgments. Then there is the discourse about categories as employed in propositions expressing synthetic a priori conditions, that would be the analytic. And then there seems to be a third discourse about categories, right? Categories understood as, he, he says, that would be an example for such a proposition, categories are pure forms of thought. That would be a third one. And now the, the contention is, which you rise, uh, raised, is whether this type of proposition itself involves reference to pure intuitions or not. He seems to think eventually yes. But if that is so, we might want to ask him back, how come that I can have ideas of reason? Because if I think of God, right? I can think of God. It's not nonsense to think of God, according to him. It's not nonsense to think of the other ideas and ideals. It's not nonsense to think of objects which, can, which cannot be objects of, of, of experience whatsoever. But what is then involved in having propositions, entertaining propositions, or having making judgments about these supposed uh, strange abstract objects, right? When I think of God, I cannot have even a pure intuition of space and time. That's excluded by the concept of God, or by the idea of God. So, okay, sorry, uh, long story short, um, so there seems to be a, yes, there seems to be a, a genuine t uh, tension here in the, in the first critique because he allows on the one hand for, um, for he, he allows for what seems to be a totally pure use of categories, right, as, to, as, of, as applied to the ideas them, themselves. Yeah, he doesn't think that these metaphysical objects, talking about metaphysical objects is nonsense. And there I think he's ambiguous because he says both in uh, that section and in other sections um, that the categories have no, he says, kein Sinn und keine Bedeutung, no sense and no meaning if we employ them without reference to intuitions. He says that on the one hand, on the other hand he does it himself all the time because he's talking about God, etc. And, and has to employ categories like unity and substance and even agency. How does he escape this tension? I'm not sure. In the, in the ideal of reason, what he does, he reverts to a classical uh, medieval move, which is analogy, reason by analogy. He thinks that uh, when, we, when we actually employ the ideas of reason, we speak analogically, analogically, analogously to the domain of the world at all. That involves again intuition. So, yeah, okay. I'm struggling. You see, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem. Oh. Use this toy here. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm also struck by a certain mismatch here. So, you have this lovely picture of the supernova. Yes. And then, when it comes to Kant's use um, on the contemporary thought, we only find philosophy items on the list. It, it, it Sorry, is quite characteristic here that all the six points are um, philosophy in turn, as it were. So I wonder whether you could say something about the use of ideas oh. in science. And that obviously brings you to, oh, to, to the party sacrifice yes. in the interest of time, that's probably buying her and so on. But yes, a bit, yeah. So if an astronomer comes to you today and says, OK, I have um, three weeks' time, should I read Kant? And what do I learn from Oh, it? yes, OK. Um, so um, what would you tell that scientist? Yes. And so what role does it play? Because it seems you can do astronomy very well without the end you've got, or yes. um, with the rest on your list, soul, world, freedom, etc. Yes. So I just wonder whether you could contextualize that for scientists. Yes. Well, could, uh, could uh, the astronomer also uh, perform his uh, enterprise without a concept of the universe, say, right? Or the world as such, or of science as such. Uh, now, the issue is here that I don't tend to think that we philosophers should really intermingle and uh, mix up with scientists. I'm, I'm a purist about it. So I think the astronomer can do his science very well, if he's, unless he's crazy, but otherwise he can do his science extremely well. I'm talking here about the theoretical reflection, take on 
what science is, right? What we discussed about philosophy of science is where it still exists. It's a theoretical, a philosophical reflection on, on the presuppositions of, uh, yeah, of, of scientific enterprise as a whole. Whether or not the astronomer would gain anything from realizing his own cognitive structures, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I, I don't have, don't have a. Well, I don't think there is such a clear separation. I mean, yes. understanding your categories is certainly very relevant to doing science. Yes. You want to understand space and time, for instance. And you mm -hmm. can't say the number of things about space and time that later turned out to be wrong. Yes. Um, so there is a clear question how modern science can be made compatible with Kantian philosophy. So there is clearly some sparks. So you, um, you, so I would um, dispute this view of philosophy that sort of philosophy and science are sort yes. of separate magisteria, as it yes. were. So clearly there is an intersection and yeah. if this sort of look at the world is fruitful, then surely ideas should contribute something to our understanding yeah. of science as well. Yes, I mean, if you accept the, his distinction between categories and ideas, then we could maybe at least reasonably say that a scientist's reflection on his current categories, like space, yeah. or time, or substance, might be very helpful, or causation, for instance. Yeah. And that does happen, and it's very fruitful, especially when we have slightly more uh, unsettled, more creative uh, periods in science. Whether also reflection on the underlying ideas um, helps I don't know, I, I would have to think about it a bit, yeah. We have to have more breakfast and uh, discuss. But no, it's a fascinating uh, question, yes, I'm not yes. pushing a line I don't know. I just I wonder, mean, it's yes. an enormous question. Uh, so. The world as a whole, I don't know. Um, for, do, you, do you think, for instance, that the world as a whole <clears throat> is a planet, for instance, yeah? Does it contain, is it made of discrete units? atoms of some kind, or do you think there is a continuity, infinitesimal continuity of space, of time, and, and matter? So, is that part of the conception of ideas or substance? I, I don't know. But if it, it is of, if this is an issue of concerning my idea of the world and not just my concept of matter, my category of matter, then maybe, yes, maybe there is a tra transition. Yeah. <clears throat> A question. Uh, I have sometimes the impression that uh, uh, on your way uh, I can uh, confuse the very general concept of with the, the ideas. The very general concept? concept uh, but with a very general concept. Uh, or any concept uh, in, uh, uh, in a science. Hmm. Uh, how, how could you distinguish between uh, uh, an idea and a very general concept? Uh, this concept of virtue. Uh, there are many virtues. I make an inventory of the virtue. And then uh, I can say virtue is not an idea. It's a very general concept uh, which subsumates all these uh, single virtues. Yes. And uh, I, it's in that case a category or? Uh, well, idea. so. Well, virtue is an idea, right? And ideas, I think it are very general concepts, but not all general concepts are ideas, right? Why, why? Uh, well, simply because, I'm following what he says here, uh, because uh, ideas have additional features. One such feature is that they are necessary for us. We can't do science without entertaining or presupposing them. That is not true for all general concepts. I can come up with some crazy concept, general concept right now. I'm not compelled in any way in entertaining or presupposing it in, uh, as an astronomer or even as a philosopher. Uh, and then the second thing is, but that's related, is that they are uh, regulative. So they are of highly important practical use right, in, in doing science. Again, that's not necessarily true for all general concepts, right? That's
colony of something. So, so you're right. I think you're right. Uh, ideas are very general concepts. In fact, they are concepts anyway, right? I said that at the beginning. He distinguishes concepts into three types: categories, ideas, and an idea. Um, but um, but ideas go beyond just being. I take it. Maybe some your points may be the opposite that the virtue, the virtue. Yes. It's a, an idea or not? Well, yes, of course, yes, it is. I mean, we, if his moral philosophy is right, yes, of course, because we can't make sense of a man's, of a human being's moral conduct without implicit reference to virtue and vice. Right? But virtue is here the guiding idea because we're striving for the good at the end of the day, not for, for evil. Um, yes, it is. Yes, it, it is definitely. An idea. Uh, uh, freedom of the will is another idea because we need that for any moral evaluation. We wouldn't be able to make sense otherwise of um, of the free behavior of, of free agency yeah? and of moral. Well, uh, one, uh, the last one short uh, question and then answer. So, I want a short comment in this case. So I want to follow up a little bit the problem with science in the uh, Kantians. So, we see that uh, at the beginning of the century, with the Vienna Circle, they were quite literary in science in, uh, in Kantians. And uh, when the uh, action theory of relativity appeared, they thought that, look, the final proof that Kant is wrong. And but at the same time, for example, Ms. Cassier, who told the, the opposite, look, the final proof that I am with them. So, uh, yeah, so all the time we have this uh, issue how to deal with uh, Kantianism and science. And uh, I think one, one year ago, it was a debate with Stephen Hawking, that uh, he's an illiterate in philosophy, but he's writing so extensively on short history of time. Yeah. Well, um, Michael Friedman is an example for a sort of Kantian contemporary philosophy of science. Yeah. I meant to think, yeah. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. No, Michael. No.